Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, I'm Larry Erickson. And for the next mm, almost half hour, I'm going to be talking about some things that I really think you should know about and uh, perhaps want to do something about. Reactions to the show, as always, can be sent to me directly. My personal email, whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there if you'd rather. Uh, the one thing I request is that if you send me email, include something in the subject line to make it clear this is not spam. And uh, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm terrible about answering email. But, all right, let's get started. Uh, I always like to start with good news where I can. We've got some yeah, sort of good news to start, and uh, in fact, from a bit of an odd source. Uh, it comes from a Washington Post columnist, Dana Milbank, who I long ago dubbed our Lord of Perpetual Smirk. Uh, he reports, and I'm quoting him here, There is no denying it. Climate change deniers are in retreat. What began as a subtle shift away from the claim that man-made global warming is not a threat to the planet has lately turned into a stampede. Uh, in fact, this has reached the point, he says, where the deniers are denying they ever denied, which actually is nothing new for right-wingers uh, or their corporate backers. In fact, uh, I recall writing to a friend, this is back in the 1980s, uh, about how when facts become so overwhelming that even the right wing can't deny them, they will, quoting myself, airily acknowledge what they previously vociferously denied. Uh, it'll be like, oh, yeah, that, of course, that. Everybody knows that. It's just this other. In the case of climate change, what you do, again, is you're trying to change the subject, and now it's trying to move from questioning the existence of human-driven climate change to grousing about how much it will cost to do anything about it and whining about intrusive regulations. In fact, it's gotten to the point where even the American Legislative Exchange Council, known as ALEC, this is a group that pushes state-level laws that often are written by industry lobbyists, uh, even Alec is feeling the heat. As recently as 2013, Alec was still proposing model legislation, which you can still find on its website, uh, model legislation about global warming, uh, in which this legislation said that the science about it, about the human impact on climate, was uncertain. And in fact, the role of human activity uh, might lead to deleterious, neutral, or possibly beneficial climatic changes. As recently as December, a uh, speaker at an ALEC meeting got uh, a burst of applause when he declared that uh, carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, it's the very elixir of life. But now... Alec has been losing sponsors and corporate members uh, over the issue of climate change uh, and in the wake of that has now actually threatened to sue two activist groups, uh, Common Cause and the League of Conservation Voters, for even suggesting that Alec has a problem with human-driven climate change. Alec's lawyers demanded the two groups immediately cease making false statements and remove all false or misleading material which they say suggests that Alec does not believe in global warming. This is how bad this has gotten for the right. Uh, both those groups, by the way, say that they have no intention of removing any such material and point to Alec's own record, including its model legislation, as proof of their contention about Alec's stand on the issue. The thing is, however, Alec is not the only issue. The Heartland Institute, which is probably best known for pushing the um, anti-science trash and latter-day incarnation of creationism called intelligent design in order to attack the scientific theory of evolution, uh, but this same group has also previously embraced a description of that group as, quote, the world's most prominent think tank promoting skepticism about man-made climate change, unquote. Even so, in December, representative of the group writing in the conservative journal Human, Efe Human Events 
went the airily admitting route, saying the science on a human contribution to climate change is settled in favor of the alarmists, and that the real issue is, quote, technologies that can reduce CO2 emissions without destroying whole economies, which, of course, in their minds, anything like a carbon tax or any other sort of regulations would. Uh, Another example of this same tactic uh, comes from Scott Siegel, who's a lobbyist for the energy industry. Uh, He says, the science issue is just not as salient as it once was. And while debate over the science was once all the rage, that's a quote. uh, Now, the key issue, he says, is whether regulations to do anything about it cost too much, weaken reliability, or are illegal. Uh, In other words, he's saying, oh, of course, climate change, but not regulations. Of course that, just not this. Now, as Milbank notes, this is a tactical retreat, a retreat to what the corporations and the right-wing allies think is sure ground from which to resist things such as new and necessary regulations on things like power plant emissions. But here's the thing. Yes, it is a tactical retreat, but it is a retreat, a retreat that marks a shift in the debate on climate change from is there human driven climate change to what do we do about human driven climate change? Now, I expect the continuing corporate answer to that latter question to be, well, whatever it is, we should do something else instead, which is why I remain a skeptic on whether or not we'll actually do anything about global warming until well after it's too late, which it may already be. But today, I'm just going to let myself enjoy the experience of knowing that there is a level of fact which even the right wing cannot deny and enjoy along with that whatever feeble hope that knowledge brings. All right, this week we have an RIP. Uh, In the summer of 1985, a woman phoned the headquarters of the Nutsoid Rabbit Brains of America, the, the NRA, and left a message saying, my name is Sarah Brady and you've never heard of me, but I'm going to make it my life's ambition to try to put you all out of business. Sarah Brady, widow of James Brady, the press secretary of Ronald Reagan, who was shot and paralyzed during the assassination attempt on Reagan in 1981, and the woman who for years became the public face of efforts at gun control, has died at the age of 73. The cause of death was listed as pneumonia. Now, oddly enough, it was not the shooting of her husband that turned her into a gun uh, control activist. That came four years later in 1985, when her young son, picked up what she thought was a toy gun from the seat of a friend's pickup truck and started waving it around. She took the toy away from him only to discover it was actually a real fully loaded 22, the same sort of gun that shot and paralyzed her husband. The thought, she said, of what could have happened hit her like a ton of bricks. She was instrumental in the 1993 passage of the Brady Bill, which was named for her husband, which required a waiting period and a background check on all handgun purchases through federally licensed dealers, uh, and also instituted a ban on the manufacture and subsequent sale of assault weapons, assault rifles, a ban which expired in 2004 and was not renewed because the wusses in Congress go all wobbly need whenever the nutsoid rabbit brains of America scowls at them. That latter fact actually also brings up the sad state of the debate or lack of it on gun control and how low that debate is sunk. The only legislative goal that Sarah Brady's organization, it's called the Brady Center, the only legislative goal it mentions is universal background checks. Meanwhile, a group it partnered with uh, for a time, the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, was actually created in 1974 as the National Coalition to Ban Handguns. They dropped that name 15 years later. Now, while that group's mission, banning certain types of weapons, including some handguns, supposedly has not changed, the fact is that none of its current campaigns in any way even address that idea. Meanwhile, 
we keep dying by the tens of thousands at guns every year. Over 30,000 of us in 2013, which is the last full year for which uh, records are available. Indeed, in that year, in 17 states and the District of Columbia, more people died from gunshot than died in auto accidents. Sarah Brady was not able to stop that trend. And I frankly would say that I think her stance or positions on gun control were not nearly aggressive enough. But the fact is, she did, she did what she could, and far more than most. And for that, she deserves our thanks and respect. So, R.I.P. Sarah Brady. Uh, a last thing on this, by the way. The NRA issued a statement saying that its thoughts and prayers are with the Brady family and, and quoting, although we disagreed on public policy, Sarah Brady was an honorable American who we always respected. Frankly, that last part, I do not believe for one second. All right, now it's time for one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. Uh, and it was a difficult one this week because to stupid was on full display across the nation this week. So much so that I have to actually have to include two runners up. So the second runner up and a squirting flower goes to uh, former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, who said, appropriately enough, on April Fool's Day that advocates for LGBT rights won't stop until there are no more churches and no more Christians in America. The latter group meaning, quoting him, people spreading the unabridged, unapologetic gospel that is God's truth. Which parenthetically likely means in Huckleberry Hound's mind that uh, Catholics are in the clear because, you know, Christians. Our first runner-up is New Jersey Assemblyman Jerry Green, who takes home these size 17 floppy shoes. This takes a bit of background. Dan Damon is 75 years old and he's a well-known blogger about local politics in Plainfield, New Jersey. Recently, he was arrested for public lewdness when police allegedly uh, caught him uh, having sex with a 23-year-old man in a parked car. Now, the day after this news came out, Green was attacking Plainfield Mayor Adrian Mapp for not removing Damon from the city's library board. And parenthetically, all three of these people, Green, Damon, and Mapp, these are all Democrats, by the way. They're all rivals. Green said he was shocked that people were taking this matter so lightly, even though the arrest actually is a low-grade disorderly person's offense. Uh, but he said, this is a 75-year-old man having sex with a 23-year-old man who happens to be a Latino. Now, that last part was weird enough on its own, but I'm not sure what it has to do with anything. But it was after that that Green really went off the rails. The mayor, he said, has yet to come out and say anything at all, which is totally shocking. It's not that he doesn't know that Damon has a sickness. I'm just hoping nobody gets killed or hurt and that somebody in the administration recognizes this is a danger to society. Now, Matt lashed back, saying he is appalled that Green would consider being gay a sickness, suggest that gay people are prone to violence and murder, and consider being gay a danger to society. Green responded by calling Matt an idiot, an embarrassment to the town, an opportunist, an opportunist rather, and a backstabber, and referred to him as Mr. Matt because I can't call him Mayor Matt. Green also insisted that he had no need to apologize to anyone because I was one of the first persons in the African-American community to come out for the rights of the gay community 10 years ago. Yeah, and I bet some of your best friends are gay, aren't they? Even if they are sick, violent, and a danger to society. All right, after that, the winner had better be good. And it is. And it's not even so much for the bigotry involved as it is for the absolute unvarnished, laugh-out-loud inanity. So the winner of the big red nose this week is the Democratic governor of Kentucky, Steve Bashir. Now, after Kentucky Attorney General Jack Conway refused to defend in court the state's ban on same-sex marriage because he said he would not try to defend discriminatory laws, Bashir's office hired an independent law firm to pursue the case. 
Uh, now, Kentucky is part of the Sixth Federal Circuit, and it was the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals that bucked the trend of other courts and upheld bans on same-sex marriage. It was that decision that prompted the Supreme Court to take up the issue uh, with oral arguments now scheduled for April 28th. Okay, on March 27th, Bashir's legal team filed on his, on his behalf the brief, their brief, for the case now before the Supreme Court. In it, the lawyers argued that the ban on same-sex marriage does not discriminate against same-sex couples. How, you say? Well, the brief said, and I am quoting, Kentucky's marriage laws treat homosexuals and heterosexuals the same and are facially neutral. Men and women, whether heterosexual or homosexual, are free to marry persons of the opposite sex under Kentucky law, and men and women, whether heterosexual or homosexual, cannot marry persons of the same sex under Kentucky law. Get it? You tell two gay guys who want to marry each other that they can't. And that's fine and dandy and not at all discriminatory because you take two straight guys who don't want to get married and you tell them they can't get married either. The utter stupidity is painful to witness. The Louisville Courier-Journal uh, noted that nearly 50 years ago, in the case Loving v. Virginia, Virginia, the state of Virginia, defended its ban on interracial marriage in essentially the same terms, saying that the ban was not discriminatory because whites can't marry blacks and blacks can't marry whites. Everybody's treated the same. And I suppose you could also say that a ban on nursing a baby in public is also quite non-discriminatory because both women and men are prohibited from doing it. Or as French novelist Anatole France put it way back in 1894, the law in its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, beg in the streets, and steal bread. People supporting LGBT rights uh, sometimes recall uh, uh, the bans on interracial marriage and say to those who support bans on same-sex marriage now to think how stupid you're going to look in 40 years. Apparently, Steve Bashar and his crack legal team, who must be on crack, uh, aren't prepared to wait that long. Governor Steve Bashir, clown, and we're taking a break. And here we are back. And we're back. We're going to do an update on the fallout from Indiana's passage of its God gave me the right to be a bigot law. Uh, I mentioned last week that the reaction was so furious that Indiana Governor Mike Pence, or as I call him, Governor Not Worth a Farthing, uh, was promising clarifications of the bill before the ink was dry in his signature. And so the clarifications came, and actually they went further than many expected. They actually said the law cannot be used to justify denying anyone service, employment, housing, and so on because of a variety of causes, including sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, some folks criticized the fix, said it didn't go far enough because it didn't involve adding sexual preference and gender identity to the protected classes under Indiana's state civil rights laws which means it is technically, legally, it is still legal to discriminate against LGBT people in Indiana, even with this fix. But personally, I have to, I have to disagree with those folks, uh, because while, while certainly the, uh, the civil rights laws should include those protections, uh, they should be changed to include LGBT folks, a move to try to do it as part of this bill would too easily be shot down as saying it's actually not germane to this particular legislation and so is out of order. Plus the fact, hey gang, this is progress. This is a win. Celebrate it. Don't slam it. Build on it. Build on the implicit recognition of the wrongness of discrimination against LGBT folks that this legislation contains. It's like the old civil rights song goes, every victory brings another, so carry it on. 
In fact, it was a bigger win than just Indiana, and the fallout extended to other states. I mentioned last week how uh, Montana, likely as a response to what happened in Indiana, uh, the legislature there rejected a proposed ballot amendment that would have uh, created, had it been passed by the voters, created a similar law to the one in Indiana. Uh, since last week, Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, who had previously said he would sign that state's own version of a God gave me the right to be a bigot law, he changed his mind and said he won't sign it until the legislature either calls the bill back and changes the wording or passes other legislation to the same effect. What's more, the Georgia State Senate had overwhelmingly passed a similar measure but after seeing what happened in Indiana and Arkansas, the, uh, the state House of Representatives just quietly let the thing die. Governor Nathan Deal of uh, Georgia said that if people want to bring it up again in the next legislative session, they'd be well advised to stick to the language in the original federal version of the bill and include an anti-discrimination provision. And then there's the North Carolina legislature, which was set to consider an even worse version of a God gave me the right to be a bigot bill. But with a new business coalition called Compete North Carolina forming for the purpose of opposing the bill, facing the prospect of a major pushback from North Carolina's own tech sector, and seeing the experience of Indiana and Arkansas, legislative leaders in North Carolina are now being, let's just call it, non-committal. Asked about this bill, State Senate President Pro Tem Phil Berger just said, it's been filed, a decision will be made as to whether or not we move it forward. House Speaker Tim Moore said essentially the same thing. So the win in Indiana has also meant wins in Montana, Arkansas, Georgia, and North Carolina. Now those wins are not final. They're not the end of it. They are Let's say they are at best the divisional title, not the World Series. But they are wins. And they are demonstrations of what I have been saying for some time. We may be losing ground all over the map. We may be losing ground economically. We may be losing ground socially, environmentally. We may be losing ground in terms of our personal privacy. But on this issue, justice will come. All right, now for our other regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. On March 25th, the, the House, the U.S. House, held a series of votes on budget plans under kind of an, an unusual arrangement where the plan that got the most votes would become the official House plan. Well, at the end of the day, surprise, surprise, the official GOP budget was the one that got the most votes. But what I want to do is mention one of the losing budgets, specifically the People's Budget. It's called, it's prepared by the Congressional Progressive Caucus. This is the fifth year the CPC has come up with its own budget. Now, the thing is, you have to realize here, this is important. This is a real budget with real numbers. It has been subjected to independent analysis. This is not just a summary of principles, it's not just bullet points. It's not just a listing of headings. And it's not a collection of fudge numbers with what Paul Krugman accurately called trillion dollar asterisks. It proposes a multi-trillion dollar public investment in areas such as infrastructure repair and improvement, uh, upgrading our energy systems, addressing climate change. These are the kind of investments that not only can produce millions of new jobs, they also will improve the quality of life across the nation. It reduces income inequality by raising taxes on the rich and corporations um, while cutting them for low and moderate income people. It improves the lives of the poor with expanded social supports. It invests in education, provides debt-free college. It improves on Obamacare by, prov by providing a public option, if you remember what that is. It invests in renewable energy technologies, and it does all this and a lot more while reducing the annual deficit not only by raising taxes on the rich and corporations, but by cutting military spending and putting an end to unnecessary wars. And in fact, many of its proposals are popular with the public. For a few examples, 80% of Americans support raising the minimum wage, which this budget does. Two-thirds think the rich pay too little in taxes. 70% oppose cuts in food stamps. Large majorities favor things like paid leave, equal pay, and affordable child care. 
all of which this budget supports, and say the government has a responsibility to ensure that employers treat employees fairly by enforcing such policies. And it does all this in a way that is fiscally sound, that stands up to independent analysis. So, of course, it only got 96 votes in the House. But that's not the outrage here. The outrage here is that until this moment, most of you had never heard of that budget. Most of you, unless you haunt lefty news sites or are a real political wonk who, who checks out sites like thehill.com and politico.com, um, you never heard of this. The budget most in line with what Americans want, the one that does the most for the many instead of the few, the one that does the most to advance economic and social justice, the one that showed you can do all that while being more fiscally responsible than the budgets of either major party was subjected to an all but total media blackout. I searched on Yahoo News for news about this from major news outlets. I got nothing. I searched on Google, got nothing. A search at the New York Times website produced zero hits. A search at the Washington Post got exactly one hit. I've said it many, many times before. We are, by our mainstream media, uninformed, malinformed, and misinformed. And no matter how many times I have to say that, it is still an outrage. All right, last for this week. An episode of our occasional feature, Everything You Need to Know, uh, where you can learn an awful lot about something in a very short time. In this case, you can learn about just how screwed up this world is in one photograph. This is a picture of a four-year-old girl named Ada Hudea. It was taken at the Atmi refugee camp in Syria in December 2014. The photo was taken by Osman Sigurli, who is a Turkish photojournalist. The caption in the Turkish newspaper where it was first published told the story of quoting, Her face suddenly drops. She squeezes her bottom lip between her teeth and gently lifts up her hands where she remains like that without a word. Sigurli was using a telephoto lens and he realized afterward that Ada was terrified, thinking it was a weapon. What kind of world is it where four-year-old children are more familiar with how to respond to having a gun pointed at you than they are with a camera? I don't know how to stop this madness. I don't have an answer. But I will be damned if I will agree that creating more blood, more death, more refugees, more frightened children is the way out. What I do know is that picture is everything you need to know. By the way, if you want to do something to help um, Syrian refugees, Doctors Without Borders is doing it in Syria, providing medical help. There will be a link at my website to where you can uh, get some information about how to help. All right, I'm out of time. There's so much I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about the Iran Agreement. I wanted to discuss John Oliver's interview with Edward Snowden. I wanted to talk about the, uh, the, the shooting in South Carolina. I don't have time for it. And what's more, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to do it next week either. Because next week is the 200th show of Left Side of the Aisle. It's also our fourth anniversary. So next week, we're going to just going to have fun. We're just going to celebrate. Next week, everything's good news, fun stuff, science stuff. Next week, for one week, the world's going to be a happy place. We'll see you next week. Have the best week you possibly can. Peace.